Hi everyone, I'll just um, wait a couple of minutes for everyone to arrive through the webinar and um, then we'll get started, okay? Now, to my curiosity, you can't see my arrow or pointer there, can you? I can actually, oh, yeah, you I can, can really okay, see okay. Yeah, you can okay, point so with that if you need to. In case I need to point things, great, great. Hi, everyone. I'll just, um, I'll give it another minute or so and then I'll get started, okay? I'll just give everyone a bit of a chance to come through. All right, well, we might get started then. So hi, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar with Lymphoma Australia, covering patient educational topics such as this one today on Hodgkin's lymphoma. I'm Erica, I'm one of the nurses here at Lymphoma Australia, and I'll be your host for this afternoon. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, and I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, and present and emerging. I'll start with some quick housekeeping. So throughout the webinar, um, you might have questions that pop into your mind. There is a question and answer function that's down the bottom of the screen in the center. Um, it's titled Q&A. So use that function and you can type in your questions. Don't worry if you think the question might possibly get answered throughout the session. We can always reiterate and go through and answer any questions, um, but it's just more so an opportunity to ask those questions just before you forget them as well too. There's a chat function down the bottom of the screen, but um, it actually won't be monitored. So just make sure that you're actually using the Q&A function for the session. And don't stress if you miss anything and um, really want more information as well too, or think that you want to revisit something that was discussed in the webinar, we actually upload all of our webinars to our YouTube channel and also to our Spotify podcast within the next few days. So we'll send a link out to you with all of those details and further information if you're looking for anything else. Just in case you didn't know, we actually have a lot of different webinars that have been previously recorded that cover a variety of topics that you that you might find really quite um, interesting and particularly relevant to you um, going through your lymphoma experience. All of our webinars are either rec they're recorded and available on our YouTube channel and on our web page as well. Recently, we've actually had a lot of um, a big focus on lymphoma in younger people, so have got a lot of information. Um, covered in those webinars. There's tips on helping to navigate the healthcare system and we actually have an upcoming series of webinars on supporting families through a diagnosis of lymphoma. So if you're interested in any of that information or think that some of these upcoming webinars that I've mentioned might be interesting to you um, or relevant to you, I, I'll pop the um, link to our events calendar in the chat function so you can sign up to anything that you think might be interesting. We also uh, include all of our support groups on our events calendar as well too. So if you're looking for people to connect with throughout your diagnosis with lymphoma and would really like to find other people who have been through it and, and talk to people and connect with people, our um, support groups are a really good way of being able to do that. So I will get started um, by focusing on today's webinar now with, uh, on Hodgkin's lymphoma with Dr. Shane Gangatharan. Dr. Gangatharan has an interest in general hematology, including malignant hematology with multiple research papers in this field covering myeloma, leukemia, and of course, lymphoma. 
Shane is a member of the WA Cancer and Palliative Care Network, Collaborative Groups and Survivorship, as well as Adolescent and Young Adults. He is a member of the ALLG, Disease Group Committees in High Grade NHL, Hodgkin's Lymphoma, Low Grade NHL, CLL and Supportive Care. As a Senior Clinical Lecturer at the University of Western Australia, he teaches medical students. He's committed to evidence-based medicine and is a review of treatment protocols as as part of the Haematology Reference Committee for EverQ. Dr. Genga Tharan is a laboratory haematologist for the Pathology Providers Australian Clinical Laboratories, PathWest, at Fiona Stanley Hospital. He also works publicly too as a haematologist at Fiona Stanley. So welcome, Shane. Thanks for giving us your afternoon. Great. Thanks so much for the invite. Um, so I will be talking about Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, now, I am a haematologist. I have an interest in lymphoma, and I also have an interest in adults and young adolescents. So Hodgkin lymphoma is a topic that sort of crosses both of those, and we'll go to that in a bit more detail. But today, um, this is what I'm going to come up. Uh, we'll talk about what is Hodgkin lymphoma and what's so special about it. Talk about the diagnosis, uh, and we talk about staging and the symptoms people get, such as B-type symptoms. And we'll spend a lot of time on the treatment. So our principles being we aim to cure this disease by minim and minimising the side effects at the same time. There are different ways we can do this. Uh, we use chemotherapy and sometimes we use radiotherapy. And then sometimes it doesn't work. And then what do we do if it doesn't work? And what are the new treatments that are available and coming along? And uh, something that's been neglected until recently is that what are the long-term side effects? There's people that you cure. What, you know, how do you manage the rest of their lives? Um, this picture on the left is Dr. Thomas Hodgkin. He's a pathologist, uh, lived a very long time ago. But it, you know, the Hodgkin lymphoma is, is named after him. He didn't do it, but you know, years later, because of his work in pathology and, and the particular uh, characteristics of what Hodgkin lymphoma looks like under the microscope, um, it, was, it was named after him. But we'll talk about it in a bit more detail. Um, if you ask anyone, even medical students or, or the general person, what do you know about lymphoma? They'll say, well, there's Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's and, and, and then it'll be unclear what happens after that. So I'll try and highlight the differences and, and then we'll look at, we are gonna focus on Hodgkin lymphoma. So all lymphomas are tumors of the white blood cells and in particular blood cells called lymphocytes. Now these lymphocytes circulate throughout your whole body uh, to sit and fight infection. So they do sit in places such as your lymph glands and your bone marrow to, uh, sitting there to fight infection. They can go outside these areas sometimes as well and even sit in places such as the gut. But when these grow out of control, not surprisingly, they cause enlarged lymph glands and, and a lymphoma. Now, the classification first started into the different types of lymphomas when they cut these enlarged lymph glands down and looked at them under the microscope. And Thomas Hodgkin found very characteristic appearances. So this is Hodgkin lymphoma on the left. And you can see these really big cells here, and these are called Reed-Sternberg cells. And, and really they're the abnormal cells that are growing out of control. The, there is an inflammatory infiltrate around it. So these are normal T cells, B cells, other cells designed to fight infection. But really the, the main ones are, are these Reed-Sternberg cells here. Um, so, for example, though, on the right hand side is a picture of a non Hodgkin lymphoma. Quite different, because as you can see, there are sheets of abnormal cells or, or, or lines there. And this is a particular type called follicular. But I guess the point I'm making is that these are you've got these very abnormal cells called Reed Sternberg cells in Hodgkin lymphoma, sheets of abnormal cells in non Hodgkin lymphoma. So, that's what caused the initial distinction, and that's why they called one Hodgkin's and non Hodgkin's but there's much more to it than that. So I'll focus in a little bit more about on these differences. Um, we've talked about pathology, what it looks down when you slice it down and look at under the microscope, but, but do they behave differently? And they're a bit quite different. Um, first of all, Hodgkin lymphoma is quite rare. And if you look at, if you're standardized for age, it's only about 2.7 in 100,000 people. And this is based on Australian data from 2018. We consider it an aggressive lymphoma. So it's something that grows rapidly over weeks to months. And it's something that we design, we want to treat right away because we don't want to let it spread. And we know that if we treat it, it is potentially curable. We can make it go away and not come back. It has a very interesting bimodal age incidence in which there are young people affected as well as older patients. If you look at non-Hodgkin lymphoma, um, it's much more common. And you can see you know, up to 23 people in 100,000 people. So it's much more common. 
but there's more subtypes within that non-Hodgkin lymphoma group, over 30 subtypes. And some of these are aggressive, just like the Hodgkin's, but some of these can be indolent, very slow growing, so that sometimes you don't even need to treat it, or we can treat it again and it comes back very slowly again. Uh, some of these are curable, but some of them are incurable, in which people live with them. And unlike Hodgkin's, which has this little peak at young adulthood, the risk with non-Hodgkin's generally increases with age. And I've tried to highlight that a bit more on that, that, that data from 2018, the Australian statistics. This is the incidence of Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, and as you can see, uh, as you get older, up to the age of 20, 24, 20, 25, 29, there's a little bit of a peak incidence here, uh, four in 100,000. Then it goes down and then it goes up again, around about, about the age of 70, 79. But remember, that's still pretty low rates, six in 100,000 people at the age of 80. Um, and if you split it up, you know, almost 50% of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma are under that age of 40, you know, 329 in 2018. On the other hand, in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, you can see that very few people under that age of you know, 40 or 35 get it. But it, the incidence does go up with age, um, so much so that the rates really can be quite high as you get much older. But often these lymphomas are indolent, things that people live with and are not aggressive and, and sometimes don't cause a problem. So these two lymphomas behave, but very differently. Um, I'm, I'm going to go in a very small biology lesson now, but we'll talk about you know, this characteristic of the biology of the, the Hodgkin lymphoma, because it, it can it does impact on how we treat it. We talked about these Reed-Sternberg cells and these, the abnormal ones. Um, they cause this inflammatory background behind it, and, that, and they grow, and, and they cause the lymph nodes to be enlarged. But it's curious, um, you know, these reed sternberg cells seem to evade normal human, um, normal immune responses. We have a, we, our body's designed to respond to inflammation as well and treat infection or inflammation, but it doesn't in this case. And there probably is some interaction. The, the reed sternberg cells develops this inflammation, but it also exhausts our normal uh, immune system. So it can evade it and it can keep growing without being attacked um, by our own immune systems. Again, that's important because some of the newer treatments do aim to recruit our immune system and, and help help with the, with the tumor kill. Um, there are different subtypes. Most are considered classical, about 95%. Um, and we have what they look like, different names for them, but, but it really doesn't change management that much. There is a much rarer subtype called nodular lymphocyte predominant um, of already a rare Hodgkin lymphoma, which behaves a bit differently. And we think that behaves actually a bit more like a B cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So in the future, that might not be classified. That might be classified a little bit differently. All right. So we'll talk about the diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma now. Um, this is not what my office line looks like. It's a bit too neat. But how, how do people present? Um, well, remember, these are tumors of the white cells, and often these white cells live in the lymph nodes. So people will often present with lymphadenopathy and large lymph nodes. The diagram on the right there is some of the lymph node groups, um, but in general, and so we have them throughout our body, as you can see, but in general, the ones that are really on the surface, the ones that we can feel are in the neck, the axilla and the groin. So yes, I have people coming to me and said, oh, look, I've got this lump in my neck that um, has been growing over weeks and months and it's not getting smaller. Now, our lymph glands do respond to infection and inflammation as well. So you get a sore throat, you get enlarged lymph glands in the neck, that's quite normal, but what we need to do and what GPs need to do is assess when something more serious. Um, and generally that's things that get bigger and bigger and bigger and, and don't get better. There are lymph glands everywhere. So there are lymph glands within the chest, within the abdomen as well. And, and these can grow out of control, but you, you can't feel them. So how those symptoms might be if there's an enlarging lymph uh, chest mass, maybe a pain or, or cough. And similarly, if there's enlarged lymph glands in the abdomen, there can be pain. Um, but once again, if these happen over weeks to months, tends to usually tends to be an aggressive lymphoma. There are other symptoms. Um, you know, this is a cancer. It's causing a lot of inflammation, and then it releases a lot of chemicals into into the system that can cause inflammation. And so, that's often patients can get something called B type symptoms. Um, these have very particular definitions, such as unexplained weight loss, ten percent of their body weight in six months. Night sweats, and, and we really mean about drenching night sweats where people are changing the bed sheets or bed clothes every day. Or alternatively, um, fevers up to 38 degrees uh, when there's no infection. And though to get this last one, you really need to have a large volume of disease causing that. A few other interesting 
things people have reported are itch or pruritus um, when there's no visible rash and there's no cause for it. And, and the curious thing is that it can be, can be worsened with alcohol. Um, that said, I've seen all sorts of presentations with uh, Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, sometimes patients get imaging um, scans done for some reason and they're found to have a lymph node mass and, and that's what leads to further investigation. I've had a young man who fell off his skateboard, injured his chest and he had a chest X-ray which found a, a large mediastinal mass. I've had another man who had a ruptured um, aorta. He was getting imaging every year for that to follow up and they, they noticed an enlarging mediastinal mass as well. So, so many different presentations for this lymphoma. All right, so we've got something suspicious. Um, how do we diagnose it? Well, just like other cancers, you really need a sample of tissue uh, to, to look at it under the microscope and prove it, just like Thomas Hodgkin. Now, because this has a, is an unusual histology when you look at it under the microscope and you need enough tissue to be able to see one of these abnormal Reed Sternberg cells. Remember, they're not everywhere, but, but they're scattered around in the lymph nodes. So you need to get a big enough sample to make sure you catch one of those. Where do we take a tissue sample? Um, if patients present with a palpable mass in the neck or the, or the armpits or the groin, that might be easy to do. Um, but on the other hand, if, if they've got a chest mass, it's very hard to get to. Um, so sometimes we do scans of the whole body to find out is there, is there a place that's really closer to the skin that we can access to, to take a sample of tissue. And then how do we take that sample of tissue? Um, it depends on how much tissue we want and, and what sort of procedure we want. Probably the easy, easiest thing is to do what's called a core biopsy. It's by using a small needle, which can give us a, take out a sample of tissue, probably about one to two millimeters thick. And we can, if you've got a, a palpable, say, lymph gland in your armpit, you can use an ultrasound to make sure that that needle goes in that lymph gland. Um, but remember, you need a big enough sample and there is the risk that you take a bit of tissue and it misses one of these abnormal cells. Um, so sometimes we take an excision biopsy. We actually get a surgeon to cut out the, the lymph node. Um, the pathologist always tells us the more tissue they have, the better. Um, and so if we get a small sample, sometimes it may not give us enough information. And sometimes we do have to go back for, for repeat samples, but um, that really is the key of diagnosis, getting enough tissue to, to make the right diagnosis. All right, so we've got our bit of tissue now. We've confirmed a Hodgkin lymphoma. We've looked at it under the microscope. Um, what do we do now? Well, that's where we want to find out where is the lymphoma. And that's what we call staging. Um, the reason that's important is that it will affect the treatment, what sort of treatment we give, how much treatment to give, and will affect the prognosis. So what we expect the outcomes to be. Um, in the olden days, it was just a plain CT scan from head to toe or neck to, to abdomen usually. But in this modern day and age, we use something called a PET scan, positron emission tomography. Um, for example, this little picture here is a, is a PET scan and, and it involves both a CT scan as well as an injection of a uh, radioactive tracer, which goes to areas of high glucose uptake. Because tumors use a lot of glucose, um, but mind you, things like inflammation and infection use glucose, your brain uses glucose, your heart uses glucose. So it's a sensitive test. It's very good at picking up lymphoma. It does have the risk of false positives, however. Um, we stage things from stage one to stage four. Stage one is just one single spot of tumor. Stage two, if it's just all the tumors just above or below your diaphragm, which is around the middle of your body, uh, around about here. Stage three is where above and below. And then stage four is where it's involving things that are outside the lymph glands, such as lung or liver or bone marrow. Um, you might hear us use the term stage a or B, so stage 1A, stage 1B, and the B refers to if the patient has B-type symptoms. Um, not surprisingly, if you have some of these B-type symptoms, it probably signifies a more aggressive lymphoma or, or a strong inflammatory process. This PET scan I've got here, you can see the outlines of the bones here, so it involves a low-dose CT scan. Then the black areas are where the glucose is going. So the, it goes to the brain, which you can expect, but you can see this really big mediastinal mass here, so chest mass. Um, you can see some masses in the neck and then the kidneys are normal here, but there are small black spots here. So this patient has at least stage three disease above and below the diaphragm. Uh, at a closer look, there may be even lung involvement, but the radiologist really give us an opinion as to, as to that and have a closer look there. All right, so we've got a diagnosis, we've got a stage. Um, we 
about to have a discussion about treatment. There are some further tests that we may need to do in the workup for that though. So when we're planning treatment, we do need further tests and that's to make sure that our treatment will be safe and to give us a bit more of an idea of the prognosis as well. We do the standard blood counts, looking at hemoglobin and things. Um, and that can be helpful for us because people who uh, have a higher risk of disease may become anemic. This is, this is a disease, it's a cancer, and, and, if you, it, and it, can, it can cause an anemia of chronic disease, which has a poorer prognosis. We want to give treatments, which can sometimes affect the liver and kidneys. So we, we screen those, make sure they're working well. We, I screen for viruses routinely. We don't want any occult viruses, such as hepatitis being reactivated when we give chemotherapy. Some of the drugs can affect the heart. So we try and get a baseline heart test with an echocardiogram, make sure the heart's pumping well. One of the drugs called bleomycin can sometimes affect the lungs. So we also, it's also good to get some baseline lung function tests as well. But you know, sometimes patients present to us very unwell, short of breath, um, and sometimes we need to get started with treatment. And so sometimes we do start treatment and aim to do these tests later. Um, you really need to weigh up the risks and the benefits sometime, but um, in the ideal situation, we get these done first. All right, so we've got all that done. Our next step is treatment. Um, so let's, before we go into details, let's talk about what are, what are our goals? Um, so our goal for this Hodgkin lymphoma is to cure it. We wanna make it go away and not come back. On the other hand, we the treatment we want to give, we wanna make sure that it doesn't cause um, too many side effects, both at the time or long-term side effects. And this is a disease where we recommend to start as soon as possible. We do want to minimize spread. And if we catch it at stage one, it probably has a better prognosis than if you let lets it grow to, to stage four. Um, we do have a few different options. Um, for example, we can use chemotherapy on its own. We can combine chemotherapy and radiotherapy, depending on the disease. And then we balance into account, what are the different side effects? Um, some of these happen at the time, such as fatigue, uh, risk of infection, uh, hair loss. Um, and then some of these have long-term effects as well, like um, can affect your heart and lungs. There is the risk of secondary cancers and the risk of affecting fertility. So that those balances and those considerations are what we take when we're deciding the treatment. But once again, our, our goal is to maximize chances of survival. So make the cancer go away and not come back as well as reduce your risk of dying from our treatments. We don't want treatments that are so strong that will cause death as well. Um, we accept that there are some treatments have a higher risk of relapse, but some, in some scenarios that might be okay if the side effects are less it and it's better tolerated. Um, so going into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, well, first of all, you know, cure rates, it's, it's never great to have a cancer, but the cure rates can be as high as 60 to 90 5%, and we do base that upon the risk factors and staging that we talked about. On the other hand, um, after we treat it, um, after five years, if, if the disease hasn't come back, then it's very unlikely to. And that's where we need to take into account the late effects of treatment. Um, this is a graph showing what's happened to people over time with Hodgkin lymphoma. We're talking about 15, 20, 30 years. Um, so this red line is the, the chance of having the disease come back. You can see that that chance goes up over five years. But after five years, it sort of plateaus and, and it's unlikely to relapse from then. But that's when the risk of having other things happen in terms of health. Um, so cardio, as anyone gets older, the, the risk of having cardiovascular events will increase with time. But this is probably at a higher rate than someone who hasn't had hydrogen lymphoma. And similarly, as we get older, we have risks of other cancers. But Again, this uh, curve is probably going up a little bit higher, the blue one, compared to other people with Hodgkin lymphoma. So we need to take into account what happens at the time when we treat people, but also what happens later down the track. And then when we're discussing the, you know, there are options, when we're discussing that patient choice is, is very important and, and it comes down to, to what toxicities people are willing to accept to, to cure their disease. Um, I've had patients choose different regimens uh, because one has different rates of hair loss and alopecia. There are some treatments that have different uh, rates of detecting fertility and that might be important to young females. Um, there are patients who, who do try and go to school and, and do want to work during treatment um, and fatigue is an aspect. So we may need to consider different treatments. 
Um, there are patients who live close to the hospital. There are patients who live two hours away. Now, if you if you want to live at home and live two hours away, maybe you want to consider a regimen that involves less travel and we come in every two weeks. Um, some other regimens, you have to come in consecutive days. The stronger treatments, because you are getting blood tested more frequently, you are getting drugs more frequently. Um, it's very difficult to do that with an intra, just a, a, an intravenous cannula. So sometimes we put intravenous ports in like this um, pick line here or our infuser port here. Um, and, and patients need to be comfortable with that. It, it will, if you have one of these in, you know, and you can't go swimming at the beach. Um, so, so these are other considerations. Uh, but it, it comes down to what are you prepared to do to, to reduce your chance of relapse? Um, in general, the lighter treatments have a higher risk of relapse, but it, it, you know, Often, if patients happen to relapse, we have a second chance to treat them again. So, so patients might want to consider a lighter treatment up front um, to manage some of the toxicities, knowing that if there is a if, if it relapses, there is a chance to treat it again. Um, the intensive treatments do tend to come with more toxicity, but a less chance of relapse. But when we do talk about these options, um, we generally don't recommend treatments with a lower chance of cure. So for example, if someone has advanced disease and they need six months of therapy, um, you know, we will still recommend that. We might recommend a lighter treatment, but to, to abbreviate it to two months when this is a disease that's curable, um, you know, we'll have big discussions with patients about that. Um, some patients don't want any treatment or want to wait. And, and we have big, you know, big discussions about that as well. And, and you know, while it is up to patient choice, you know, they need to be aware of what the risks are, what the outcomes will be. In that decision making. Um, I'm going to focus, a, you know, we didn't talk about fertility being one of these risks, I'm going to talk about that as well because um, chemotherapy and radiotherapy can damage um, sperm and can damage eggs, but we have some preservation options as well um, and what those options are depend on what type of treatment we're going to, be, we're going to give, how strong is it and, and do we have time to, to do some of those uh, preparations. Um, for males we can freeze semen, um, now, they, it's estimated that the live birth rate with, with, with that uh, can be you know, 65, 70%. Um, females, it can be a bit trickier. Um, first of all, we talk about chemotherapy choices. This might be, a, be um, one consideration when you use a chemotherapy that's lighter. Um, probably the most common thing we do though in, in young females is to give hormonal ov ovarian suppression. Um, the thoughts are to try and suppress the hormones, put the ovaries into a, a prepubescent state, which will protect them from damage from chemotherapy. Um, data on this is a little bit limited, but this is probably our most common thing that we do. It does involve monthly hormonal implants. Um, so, so it's fairly easy to do. The next two steps is, are a bit harder. Um, to egg freeze or to freeze embryos, you need to stimulate cycles. So you need a little bit of time, um, at least a month, and sometimes longer than that before starting treatment. Um, so if someone comes in with stage four disease, um, you know, respiratory compromise, it's probably, it's probably not an option. On the other hand, if a young lady has a very limited stage disease and, and wants, really wants to preserve that, that, that might be one of those rare scenarios which we can do it. Um, egg you know, with embryo freezing, you obviously need some donor sperm as well. Egg freezing, obviously you do need, need to stimulate the eggs. Um, the live birth rates are slightly higher with embryo freezing than eggs, but I think they're both around 60% these days, live birth rates. Um, uh, I do refer people to a gynecologist before starting treatment, um, and often there's a time issue, but sometimes they even do phone consults beforehand, at least to have a discussion. Um, and I, I send ours to, to Roger Hart, who's one of the fertility specialists in WA, and and I guess one of the aspects that he counts his patient on is, um, is this graph here. And this is the, the live birth rate in, in most normal females. Um, and I've noted it does go down with age. And particularly when you get into the, the later 30s, you know, even in normal females, the live birth rate decreases. So if you give chemotherapy on top of that, um, you, you will you know, damage some more eggs. So it does make a very, very low risk of um, live birth rates if the patient's older. And even some of these options such as ovarian suppression may, may not work in any case. But, um, but that is a conversation that needs to happen before you start treatment where possible. All right, so we've done all the preparation beforehand. Um, we're coming up to the treatment stage. So what is the treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma? It does depend on the stage, like we mentioned. And in general, we divide um, it into two groups. It's treatment for early stage Hodgkin lymphoma, treatment for advanced stage. 
early stage considered stage one and two, um, advanced stage considered stage three and four, or two, stage two B with some other risk factors. Um, for example, if someone's having B type symptoms or someone's got a uh, disease that's going outside the, um, the lymph nodes. In general, if it's early stage, we try and give limited chemotherapy, so two to four cycles, and then radiotherapy. Um, so radiotherapy is actually very effective in Hodgkin lymphoma. And before we had chemotherapy, that's all they used to do. They used to radiate basically the whole of your body. And, and it did work. It did shrink the disease. Um, we have even tried to do trials where we omit radiotherapy and don't give it and just give chemotherapy alone. It looks like by giving, by giving the radiation, you do get a few extra uh, percentage reductions in risk. So, so where possible, we do give, give radiotherapy to the area of disease. Um, that said, it depends on the risk of the radiotherapy. Um, so radiotherapy is, is localized. For example, we, this is a patient with some red spots where the disease is. So if we're giving chemotherapy and then radiation after that, we'd give radiation this spot here and then the neck and the armpit. It's very easy to give radiation at the neck and the armpit. It doesn't have too many side effects. But when you're giving radiation in the chest, you've got some big organs behind there. You've got the heart there. Um, you've got breast tissue. So it does mean that the, it presents with some risks of heart disease for the radiation um, damaging the heart and, and slightly increased risk, in the, uh, risk of breast cancer as well if there is breast tissue affected. So you know, we have big discussions with radiation oncologists whether you know, how well they can give the radiotherapy and what the risks are. And there are some patients will elect the risk of late effects from the radiotherapy is too much if there's, and, and we may just give chemotherapy alone. Uh, on the other hand, for advanced stage disease, it is very difficult to radi give radiation to a lot of parts of the body. So we just give chemotherapy alone, but we'll give more. So rather than your two, four cycles, we'll give four to six cycles of chemotherapy. Um, so I've got two PET scans here. This is a, a young man who's got stage two disease. We found he had a, um, a spot there and a spot there in his chest, mediastinum. So we caught him early stage. Um, we discussed with the radiation oncologist, can you give radiation there without damaging the heart too much? And they said, oh, yeah, it's quite high. It's above the heart here. Um, there are some small risks, but probably small. So, so we gave him two cycles of chemotherapy and radiation. On the other hand, on the right here is another PET scan. It's the inverted image, so don't worry about the colours. But as you can see, there's a very, very large um, chest mass there. Um, it's a young lady. It's the, the, the mass in the chest is larger. It is stage two, it's just above the diaphragm. But if you give radi radiation there, there's a huge chest area. It will encompass the breast and heart. And um, for, for this reason, we've decided to not give radiation and instead go along the route of giving six cycles of chemotherapy instead. So these are the, some of the decisions that, that go ahead um, when, we, when we decided what, what's the best treatment. Um, I did talk a little bit about that there are some chemotherapy options, a lighter and a stronger one, and I'll, I'll discuss some of that today. In general, there are, there are, two, there, there are two chemotherapy regimens commonly used. Um, one is called ABVD, one is called escalated via COP. Uh, the one on the left, ABVD, is, much, is the lighter one, the escalated via COP is, is a much stronger one. So for example, the ABVD is given as an outpatient. Patients come in every two weeks and then go home and back in two weeks and come home. Um, and, but they do get it for up to six months. Um, we found that when giving this to young adults, the risk of infection is extremely low, probably less than 1%. Um, it doesn't always cause hair, has, cause, always cause hair, sorry, cause hair loss. Uh, it can cause some fatigue, but I have had patients work through it who want to do, do that. Um, and it has less effect on fertility. So we don't we don't actually think it will, for a young lady, it, it may not affect the birth rate that much. On the other hand, this escalated via cop, um, while some of it can be given as an outpatient, it's often started um, in hospital because it's quite, it needs close monitoring. It involves more frequent intravenous infusions and we do put one of those infuser ports in. It does cause more infection, more fatigue. Patients may need transfusions um, because there are some more toxic drugs. There is some data that may, increase the risk of later cancers, but um, that's very hard to monitor as you can expect. You know, we're always 10 years behind uh, behind giving the treatment to monitoring our data later on. But, you know, the reason as to why you'd give this stronger one is that we know that it probably has a smaller chances of relapse. And, and maybe even a, with the ABVD, your chance of relapse may be 10%. And with the escalator B a couple, maybe, sorry, with ABVD, risk of relapse is 
but it might be 10% with escalated beer cough. So up to, up to a 10% difference there. Um, so once again, things to consider, but you know, this is a perfectly good treatment, the ABVD, because it has less toxicities up front. And if you're in that unlucky group, the 20% who relapse, there are some second line treatments where you can still try and treat it. Um, during treatment, look, it's a lot to go through. Um, you know, obviously one treatments are stronger than the other, but you know, really our goals during treatment is providing a lot of supportive care. Um, you, know, you, you look at these chemotherapy side effects and, and there's a long list, not everyone gets them, but some people do. And, and every time people see me in clinic, we, this is the, our mainstay of treatment. Um, as well as making sure that treatments work, we wanna make sure what are the side effects of the treatment and how do we manage it so we can keep going. Um, um, nausea and vomiting, we can use antiemetics. Patients get oral ulcers, we use mouth care. Um, there's reflux, you can use antacids. Fatigue, is that very difficult to manage? Um, there's no simple trick for it, but you know, exercise has been shown is probably the, the only thing that can improve this. Um, patients who are anemia, anemic will be managed given transfusions, infections will be managed with antibiotics. If patients lose weight and uh, due to poor appetite, it's important to maintain their body weight and maintain the nutrition. Um, some you know, the chemotherapy or side effects can cause pain and we manage it with analgesia. But sometimes if, if their side effects are really bad and some patients are having a high risk of infections or causing so much fatigue they can't get out of bed, that's where we need to adjust some of the, the, the drugs in our chemotherapy. Um, if it is affecting the heart and lungs, we definitely need to adjust that. But this is a moving feast. Uh, we always adjust and, and adapt as to how people are responding during treatment. So that's managing the side effects. But like I said, the next step is the treat, treatment response. And is it working? We do check that during treatment. So if someone's getting six cycles of treatment, often we'll do an interim PET scan after two cycles. Um, a couple of reasons for this. One is that we want to know what's working, uh, particularly if there's not palpable lymph glands that you can feel going down. We want to know is the mass in the chest shrinking and, and you can't feel that. Um, the second is that you know, we are trying to minimize side effects. Um, so we are, we are getting good information now that if you achieve a very early response, if all these black spots go away after two cycles, then you probably can reduce your treatments in because clinical trials have showed that. Um, um, and then we, we confirm remission by our end of treatment PET scan. We usually leave this for one to two months after chemotherapy. We want to reduce the risk of getting false positives or showing, showing up inflammation, um, but that's how we prove remission. And afterwards, um, we only do PET scans if this suggestion of disease relapse. There's actually very, no, very, no data to support that you need to do repeat PET scans after someone's finished treatment if you already approved remission. Um, I have some more PET scan pictures here because often the, the radiologist will give us a, a nice set of images here. Um, this is a man before, after, sorry, before, and this is after two cycles of chemotherapy. So as you can see here, a lot of black spots on either side of the lungs and after two cycles of treatment, um, we left with a couple of black spots. So he reported some infection in the arm, so we weren't concerned about that. There was a little tiny, tiny spot there. We had a great talk about that. Um, we decided based on that, we weren't going to reduce his chemotherapy. So we continued on the same chemotherapy for, for the six cycles. All right, so um, you know, he, he worked, but, but what if it doesn't work? And, and what do we call it if it doesn't work? Um, well, we call it refractory disease. If we do a PET scan at the end of treatment and we still find that there's some residual disease there, uh, we call it relapsed disease if the, you know, the end of treatment PET scan goes away, but then, but then someone reports, oh, there's new symptoms and we do a PET scan and the mass grows back. Um, remember that PET scans can sometimes show infection inflammation. So often we will try and biopsy it to confirm that it is actually relapsed hydrogen lymphoma because it does have a lot of implications. Um, this is a gent who completed his chemotherapy. He had this tiny spot, of, spot left behind there. We weren't sure if it was disease or inflammation, um, very difficult to biopsy and stick a needle in there. So we repeated a PET scan two months later, and fortunately it shows that it's grown there. We were able to biopsy it then and prove relapse Hodgkin lymphoma. But as I mentioned, cure is still possible with second line treatment, and that's what we've gone on to with this gent. So um, what, what do we do if the first line treatment doesn't work? And it's not common, 10 to 20% of patients, but it is, is a very important group of people. 
Um, well, it makes sense that we don't give the same thing again. If it didn't work the first time, let's change the chemotherapy um, and let's give stronger chemotherapy if the patient's fit enough. And, and trials have proven that if you give change your chemotherapy and give stronger treatments, it, it does improve outcomes. And we can cure probably over 50% of patients. Um, so we will give patients two to three cycles of something called salvage chemotherapy, which is a different recipe, which will start to shrink the disease down. But to really whack it on the head, we do something called an autologous stem cell transplant. Um, it's, it, it sounds very serious, and, and, and it is a stem cell transplant because we are taking the patient's own cells out and putting them back in. But really what we want to do is give high dose chemotherapy um, so much so that any residual lymphoma cells get wiped out. So it does involve mobilizing the patient's own stem cells and collecting them and storing them in a bag and, and in the freezer and then giving them very, very high dose chemotherapy. And so that it doesn't cause too many long-term effects there, or, or so it doesn't wipe out their bone marrow for a long period of time, we reinfuse the stem cells back in so that it helps grow quickly and reduce the risk of side effects. Um, still a very strong treatment, but um, we find that most patients, especially if they're young, can, can get through this. There is the risk of death from the procedure itself of 1%, but, um, but obviously looking at cure rates at 50%, we, we do try and take that risk. All right. But what if that doesn't work? What if um, you do your initial salvage chemotherapy and it doesn't shrink it at all? You can't go and do the transplant. Or on the other hand, you do the transplant and it comes back afterwards. Um, look, there's no standard of care when that happens. Often we will consider that it will be very hard to cure. It will be very hard to make the disease go away and not come back in that, in that circumstance. Um, we can try chemotherapy uh, a third time. Um, but usually we think it might come back up despite that. Um, if the disease has come back just in one spot, um, remember that radiotherapy is very effective. So we can just try zapping those one spots, but it doesn't stop the disease coming back in different spots. Um, which we can try something different. There are newer treatments which we'll go into, such as targeted treatments and immunotherapy. Um, and while I did talk about that, we don't usually expect people to be cured. Um, the only way we want to do that is to try a different type of transplant, something called an allogeneic stem cell transplant, where we take the immune system from a different person and transplant that into the patient and wipe their bone marrow out. Um, a pretty big deal, as you can imagine, that, and it has high risks, unlike the, the self-transplant, the auto-transplant, but in young patients who, are, who have relapsed despite all doing all the right things, this is sometimes considered. All right, but um. I might talk about some of those something different treatments, those targeted treatments to start with, because they are available in Australia now. And this is one of them. So this is a drug called brentuximab Um, It's a drug immunoconjugate. So what that means is that there is, it is an antibody here. You see the green sort of Y-shaped things. And, and that's designed to bind to markers on the cell surface of that Reed-Sternberg cell. That antibody has chemotherapy therapy bound to it, which is the red dots. So basically what this enables it to do is that it binds directly to the cell and directs the chemotherapy straight to the cell. Um, so with treatments, so it's an infusion given every three weeks um, and the response are excellent. It's, it's well tolerated because it's unlike the other chemotherapy, it doesn't have the other collateral organ damage. It's very targeted. Excellent responses, about 75% of people will have a shrinkage in their tumor. But if we keep doing it, we find that eventually um, patient will still progress on it dis despite this treatment. Um, so usually people won't go longer than a year before the disease coming back. So it's, it is a potential option, not curative. Um, well, okay, so we're trying to, what if we take a different approach? You know, um, remember we talked about that these Reed Sternberg cells try to evade the immune system. What if we recruit the immune system? Um, and that's the point of immunotherapy or drugs called checkpoint inhibitors. The Hodgkin lymphoma cells, um, they're, they're sneaky. And then what they do is they express this thing called PD-1 ligand. Um, we have our normal immune system, the T cells here, which go on and bind um, things that are abnormal, such as bacteria, such as cancers by this T cell receptor. But, it, but these T cells don't wanna be overactive. They don't wanna attack itself. So they have something called PD-1 here. Um, and when something's bound to the TP1, it will actually slow down, it will be inhibited. But the tricky tumor cells express this PD1 to escape the immune system. So if we block this pathway between the PD1 ligand and the PD1, um, can that, that really enhances the activity of the T cell and helps it uh, cause some tumor death. 
So trials are being done with these drugs called pembrolizumab and nivolumab, which are called PD-1 inhibitors, um, and they are effective as well. Uh, you know, this is non-specific, so these treatments are used for other diseases, and in particular uh, malignant melanoma, is where they're also used. But in Hodgkin lymphoma, um, the responses are once again excellent. 70% response rates of shrinking the tumour down. Um, again, pretty well tolerated, as you can imagine, because you, suddenly you're activating all these T cells. There are some autoimmune side effects that can happen, but generally these are manageable. Um, there was a trial which put it head to head with that drug that I mentioned before, brentuximab, and it showed that it did um, it did cause a longer response, probably over the, just over than a year, but it's still not considered curative. Um, so we still need to do better. So, so how are we going to do things better? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about future developments now. When I, when I say future developments, this is sort of current. Um, can we develop better treatments so patients don't relapse in the first place? And, and yes, there are a lot of trials um, looking at this. What if we add some of those new agents that we talked about that bring tuximab and, and use it right up front rather than waiting till people relapse? So, so people have thought about that and done trials. Um, so this is a big trial um, where they use that brentuximab vodotin and sort of combined it with the ABVD. They substituted it for one of those drugs there and they compared it with the usual ABVD. And they found that if you gave the brentuximab vodotin and the ABVD, you had less relapses than if you got the usual ABVD. Um, so, you know, chance of not relapsing at two years is 82% versus 77%. Um, that was published quite a while ago and that's great. Um, you know, in some countries, in particular America, where they have a slightly different reimbursement system, um, that is that's what they do, a standard of care. Um, that initial study showed, however, that you didn't live longer if, if you got the, the new treatments. Um, and that's probably because if you relapse, you can still be cured with a stem cell transplant. So, um, and this is a very expensive drug. So you know, when with, with our PBS or Medicare system looking at that, seeing that it, it was an expensive drug that didn't improve survival, um, it, this isn't available in Australia on PBS. That said, um, this trial, people kept following it up for a few more years, and, and at five years, they did show there was a difference in survival. So at six years, 94% um, of people were alive compared with 89%. So this is much more compelling data. This is much pretty recent, published only last year. Um, so look, this might be a way to, to really bring this to frontline therapy, but as of the moment, it's not currently funded. Um, so this is sort of current where we are right now, um, but this is sort of breaking, breaking news. Um, there was a conference in Switzerland last month, which I went to, it's nice and warm, but there were some new trials presented once again. Um, so we talked about that brintuximab and AVD looking very good. What if we use that other drug, that checkpoint inhibitor, get your own immune system involved and, and, and combine it with ABD? And they did a head-to-head -head study and it showed that the nivolumab, the checkpoint inhibitor combined with ABD had a, a less chance of relapse. Um, it was only followed up to one year, so it's very early data so far, um, but that's very promising. You certainly would want to see a little bit more and if it made people live longer than the other one, then, then that, that really could be the next standard of care. Um, we talked about that really strong treatment um, that's effective, but strong. So what if we could remove some of the, the really strong drugs and, and substitute them for these newer ones, like the brentuximab? Um, and a, there was a trial that compared that escalated beer cop to the brentuximab and, and similar drugs got swapped out. And they found that with this new one, um, it was less toxic. You didn't need as many transfusions. You could do it as an outpatient and have an effect on your fertility as much. Um, and it still had very good outcomes at three years, 92 to 95% of patients have not relapsed. So um, pretty mature data. I didn't show any difference in survival, but you know, with the improvement in the hospitalizations and um, the toxicities be enough to get over the line for, for PBS and, and make it worthwhile, um, once again, remains to be seen. Uh, I think they are doing that in Germany as standard care now, where, where possible. Um, but what about the, the proper future? Um, like, like, the Jetsons and whatnot. So, well, look, I do think that in Australia, we will look to combine some of these newer agents frontline. Um, it really is a matter of the regulatory bodies coming on board and, and the costings coming down as well. But we also look to look at other trials as well. And, and some of these are in the patients of the, these risk groups. So these patients who 
who don't, you know, the small group who relapse afterwards, how do we improve their outcomes? You know, 50% cure after your relapses, can we do better than that? Um, and how about these older patients? We've talked a lot about the younger patients, but you know, we mentioned that still half the patients are over the age of 40. So there's a whole bunch of the patients who aren't really considered. And, and a lot of these older patients over the age of 60 aren't, aren't included in the clinical trials that I talked about. Um, but there are things ongoing and there are things going on in Australia as well. So um, these are some of the trials which are opening, if not opened, by our uh, cooperative group in Australia, our collaborative group, the ALLG. Um, the ALLG HD11 trial is a trial for those patients who relapse in Hodgkin lymphoma. And instead of giving that salvage chemotherapy and then the stem cell transplant, how about we give them those new drugs, the rintuximab and the checkpoint inhibitor together, and then try the transplant. So maybe we'll be able to get more people to transplant and maybe we'll do better. So that has not started in Australia yet. Um, we're collaborating with Canada, uh, um, but hopefully that will, will get going in the future. And then we talked about that older age group, um, which are unfortunately neglected in the clinical trials, you know, and partly because some of them may not be able to tolerate that ABVD treatment. Well, what if we use lower dose chemotherapy and then combine it with one of those checkpoint inhibitors? And, and that has opened in, I think, at least one site in Australia already. Um, it will open at our site as well here at Pion Stanley. All right. Um, so I've talked about a lot of the treatments, but but a big part of lymphoma is, is what happens after treatment as well. Um, especially if you've got a young adult who gets treatment for lymphoma, um, they've got a lot of their life to live. What are the considerations for that? Well, um, first of all, we talked about, we make sure that your PET scan looks good. Um, if it's in complete remission, then great. If it's maybe, if there are some suspicious areas, we sometimes repeat scans. Um, but if there's any suspicious areas, then we try and biopsy it. But assuming a patient's in remission, we all just monitor them clinically for relapse. Um, and it varies depending on where you work. Um, we'll see patients every three to six months for two years. And we ask them, are you getting any lymph, large lymph glands? We'll examine them. Are you getting these B-type symptoms? And if they're well, we, we, we keep monitoring them. Um, after two years, if you don't relapse, then the chance of relapsing are less likely. So we see them less frequently after that. And, and often at five years, I, I say, look, you haven't relapsed. You're unlikely to relapse. Um, you can probably be managed by your GP. Yeah. Um, and that's where late effect monitoring comes in. Um, so you know, a, a big issue that we'll, we'll talk about in the next slide, but you know, there's more to post-treatment care than just looking for relapse, isn't there? And so, so these are some other things that we do need to consider. So you know, you've had a young person who's undergone treatment that can affect fertility. It's important to, to readdress that once again. So you know, for patients who have banked sperm, you can, you can test that. Um, and, and you can do their own sperm testing as well. For, for patients who uh, are females, you know, they can do hormone testing and, and try and get an idea of their, their likelihood of fertility in, in the future or having children or whether they need to do consider other options as well. Um, you have patients who you potentially have made very unwell. It's important you get them back on track physically and, and we can give them exercise physiology, but they've had school interrupted, work interrupted. You, we need to make sure we get that back on track as well. Um, it's a pretty big thing, cancer. Uh, it is a trauma. So, you know, we do offer patients counselling and, and patients become depressed, we can offer them you know, other psychiatry and treatment for that as well. Um, but at the five year mark, uh, that's where we, where we discharge patients from our clinic. Um, and that's where the survivorship happens or the late effects monitoring. Um, and there's a lot of talk about that. It hasn't been done well in Australia that yet. We're always trying to get better. Um, but but basically, after five years, what I do at the moment is I you know, outline all these late effects to the patients, what they need to watch for. I give them a, a letter uh, highlighting their treatments, um, and what was done and, and what recommended monitoring is, is involved. I do get them linked back into their GP. Um, a lot of talk about that and Zeman talk, do you have long-term su late survivorship clinics and that sort of thing? And, and people have surveyed patients and it's... And, um, Things probably have changed over time. There probably used to be a big push to coming into the medical services and coming to big hospitals and, and, and having late effects screening from time to time. But um, a lot of patients, as survivors, want to get on with their life and, and go back to normal. And, and sometimes that is actually better in, in, a, in a primary care setting, so with their GP, um, knowing that there is a safety net with, with the tertiary centres. So um, that's something we're still working on. We're trying to improve. But there are two considerations in, in late effects and that graph at the, the start kind of highlighted some of them. Um, there is an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. 
Um, so I advise that patients need to control their cardiovascular risk factors and, and see their GP and get their blood pressure checked, cholesterol, that sort of thing. Um, if you've had chemotherapy, that can affect the heart. If you've had radiation that affects the heart, then that, that probably is an indication for doing echocardiograms, actually checking the function of your heart from time to time. Um, I did mention that the slight increased risk of secondary malignancy or sec other cancers. Um, it's not super high, but it is higher than other people the same age. But because the rate is still over, overall low, it is recommended that just the usual age-appropriate cancer screening should be done. So you know, skin checks for females, pap smears, then when you get to the age of 50, the standard bowel cancer screening, breast cancer screening. Sometimes the treatment does uh, suggest a certain screen. So for example, um, if you had very strong chemotherapy, you should, probably should get a blood check once a year to make sure we haven't damaged the bone marrow. If you had radiation near the neck, that can damage the thyroid. You might need to check the thyroid levels from time to time. And if a female does get um, ra radiation in the chest, um, you know, we do start breast cancer screening earlier, eight years after, after the, the radiation as well. All right. Um, but there are, you know, I talked about a bit about the future, but there is still a real future future. Um, there are new treatments still being, ex being tested and, and coming out. Um, some of these treatments are available for other lymphomas. There are what we call CAR T cells, chim chimeric antigen T cells, where you take out your own lymphocytes, you modify them to attack the, the Hodgkin lymphomas and infuse them back in. There is these bispecific antibodies which are designed to link your own immune system with the tumor cells as well um, in very early stages in Hodgkin lymphoma, but they may become prominent later on. And I do think we need to improve, and while this is a very good prognosis disease, I think we need to improve certain areas. Um, older patients have been neglected for a long time, so we need to look at the best treatments for them. I did mention that this is a treatment, that this is a, this is a, a disease that can occur in the pediatric populations as well. Um, but unfortunately, that's caused a big divide in the way our, our health system works. Um, you know, in, in Western Australia, as soon as you become 16, you're, you're treated in the adult hospital. Um, but, but a lot of these trials that I've done have been very separate. So a pediatric, there are pediatric trials, there are adult trials. Um, and if a patient's 16, then, then which one do you choose? Um, look, I think, I think we are trying to see the way forward. And, and one of those other trials that I mentioned before did incorporate people down to, uh, to, to 12 years old, um, all the way to adults. But these are things we need to think about. How do we, we better improve that for young adults who's a group that gets... Um, they get sandwiched sometimes and 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 in real because they're not quite an adult and they're not quite a child. Um, I do think we need to improve our late effects monitoring and, and education about this. And and we need to improve the time about these drug developments. Um, you know, this brintuximab bodotum has been around for a long time now, but we still haven't got it approved in Australia. So how do we do that? Um, probably a few things we need to make sure that drug development occurs faster. We need better clinical trials rather than some of these trials take a very long time. How do we fast track that? And then when these trials are done, how do we fast track approval so that we can use it in our patients as well? Um, so I don't know the answer to that, but those are some of the, the, the things I think we can improve on in the future. All right, so that pretty much comes to the end of my talk. So I've, um, I've covered an overview of Hodgkin lymphoma. I've talked about some of the current treatments. Um, and we talked a little bit about the future. What are the current trials? What are future trials? And we'll talk about what happens after you treat someone for the Hodgkin lymphoma and late effects. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Shane. Um, that was a really great session, actually. I really enjoyed it. And I think that many people in the audience found it really relevant and a lot of interesting information. We've actually had quite a lot of questions come through already. So <laughs> if anyone else has got questions, just pop them in and I'll do my best to get through all, as many as possible. Um, so one of the first questions that come through from Sue, um, she's wondering if there's anything associated with triggering lymphoma, like in specific, specifically things like pregnancy. Yeah. Uh, for Hodgkin lymphoma, look, not, not really. Um, it's, it, look, there is, I didn't go into detail, but there is an association with um, EBV or the glandular fever virus uh, with the Hodgkin lymphoma, because you know, it, it may dysregulate your immune system in some way. Um, and so we have found some associations there. Uh, having said that, a lot of the population get you know, viruses and don't get Hodgkin lymphoma as well. So look, um, not, not, not so much. With pregnancy, Look, the, the, this is a disease of the young adults. So yes, uh, there are people who we definitely diagnose 
either during pregnancy or, sh or shortly after. There's probably nothing hormonal that, that, that causes it. And unfortunately, I think there are a lot of confounding factors. When, when patients uh, are pregnant, you get tired uh, and, and you get a lot of these symptoms. And I think, um, unfortunately, pregnancy is a situation where we often do get late diagnoses because of these other co-founding factors. But, um, but no, there are no strong associations with Hodgkin lymphoma apart from that yeah. age group. Okay, and, I, and that's exactly right. I suppose so many of the, the symptoms or indications of the lymphoma do, as you say, overlap with those of pregnancy as well too. So it makes it much harder to find. Um, okay, so there's another question that's come through. It's specific to NLPHL. So does the subtype of lymphoma determine the treatments available? And the reason that this person's asking is because as of WHO 2022, um, it's now recognised as a subtype of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So they're asking que a question about whether or not that means that they're suitable potentially for treatments that would be used in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Sorry, I've got to that already. Um, so... First of all, going back, you know, it used to be grouped together. So all those other treatments that I talked about, ABVD, BACOP, it has been used in the nodular lymphocyte predominant logical lymphoma. But we did find out it was behaving differently. So when we thought, you know, we should have cured this disease, we're finding that patients were actually getting relapses, you know, 10 years later. Um, and we're finding out it is a, a B cell as well. So, so yes, um, people have used B cell lymphoma treatments for that nodular lymphocyte predominant logical lymphoma. The problem is you've got already, it's a, it's a subtype of Hodgkin lymphoma and it's a rare subtype of Hodgkin lymphoma. So you get a Z, which is extremely uncommon. Um, so how do we get information from this? It is very hard to design prospective trials because it comes up so uncommonly. So, but we do, we have pulled a lot of data internationally. So we all look at, well, what have we got and what have we used? And, and we pull it, we have got that. So there are registries of hundreds of patients with that nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma with different various treatments. And some of them being Hodgkin lymphoma treatments, some of them being not Hodgkin lymphoma treatments. So, um, so, so yes, yeah, um, you, know, you do, you can use non-Hodgkin lymphoma based treatments for it. And, and we can, while the prospect of data is limited, we have a lot of retrospective data which shows that you can do that. Um, I guess the good news is, is that a lot of the old treatments, so standard Hodgkin lymphoma treatment, does work for it. It will shrink it down um, as well. And it is going to be very difficult to find the optimum treatment for it because it is such a rare disease. So we need to use things like these um, big registries where a lot of our centres pull our data together, what are the disease and, how, and what has been used, to, we can try and tease apart what the best treatment options are. Okay. All right. Thanks for clarifying. Um, so there's another question that's come through from Christine, and she's asking specifically about progressive transformation of germinal centres. She's yep. struggled to find some information about it. And would you yep. like to yeah, yep, we'll be able yep. to give some more information? Yeah, I could try. Look, it's um, that's a, that's a tricky one. So you know, would I I mentioned this first when someone presents with um lymphoma, you, well, sorry, you, know, you present with enlarged large lymph glands, and and you take biopsies of it. Now, the progressive transformation of germinal centers is considered more of a, a benign condition, sort of, and, and you can, there are many other benign conditions. There are what we call reactive lymph glands and all sorts of things, um, but it's not considered a, a lymphoma. Uh, having said that, there are unassociations. We know that if you take a, if someone's got an enlarged lymph gland, you take a sample and it shows this you know, transformation of germinal centers. Um, it, it can mean that a, the patient may have Hodgkin lymphoma at the same time or, or another lymphoma. Uh, so, so you need to make sure that what's happening to the rest of them. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a hard one because you, you take a sample, you show this, okay, it's not Hodgkin lymphoma, and then you need to monitor. And a few lumps and bumps pop up and you think, oh, could this be changed to Hodgkin lymphoma now and you need to take a sample? So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's a, that's a difficult one. I, I think it is, you know, it, it is, the actual biopsy shows a non-lymphoma, but it does have associations with Hodgkin lymphoma. So patients with that, you, you do need to monitor who you need. To, and, and a lot of it is clinically, uh, new lumps and bumps coming up. How is it behaving? Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a difficult one. Okay. Um, all right. So Sue has asked uh, for clarification about stage four being curative intent treatment, and she wants to understand the risk factors of it returning after treatment. Yeah, yeah. Um, so people have done, tried to work out scores. So, um, so for example, advanced Hodgkin lymphoma, yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, and I like to quote people, what, what are your chances of your of cure? Uh, and like I said, sometimes anywhere between 65 to 
So people have developed uh, prognostic scores. So for example, one is called the International Prognostic Score. Um, it's also called the Hasen Cleaver Score because of the German guy who kind of wrote the paper. So it has about seven risk factors and it includes things like, is it stage four or stage three? Um, what is the hemoglobin? What is the lymphocyte count? What is the albumin? Um, and what is the white cell count? And you can plug that all into a, a calculator uh, to give you an idea of what, the, what your risk of the disease coming back is. I guess the caveat I will say is that this risk score was developed quite a long time ago. It was developed with those older treatments that I talked about, the ABVD and the escalated via cop. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it doesn't change our management. It doesn't usually change our management um, to the prognosis, but but would you just, you know, if you're deciding to go at ABVD versus escalated via COP, um, there's no good data to say that you, know, you do better if, if you use either, either treatment. Um, you know, it might make sense that if you've got a higher risk, you know, seven risk factors that on the Hazen Cleaver score, you might want to use a you might want to take that risk and, and use a more intensive treatment, but there are no prospect of trials to show you that's what you need to do. But yes, um, that, that is the, what, that's uh, how I get some of those numbers through that international prognostic score. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so Janet's very, very interested in the clinical trial that you mentioned for elderly patients. How yeah. would someone go about accessing more information or keeping up to date with that information as it comes about as well? Yeah, yep, there's a few different ways. Um, so there's, there's for me as a clinician, I use the there's a clinical trial uh, resource that you the Clin Trials app, which I can, can look for trials there. Um, it is conducted through that ALLG, so you can contact that ALLG directly and find out what sites are opening. Um, but you know, say if a patient develops, a, you know, an older patient develops a, a Hodgkin lymphoma, then you know they're, they're the hematologist should be able to find out where those where those centres are that have the site open. Absolutely. So I think as well too, just for um, anyone who was interested in um, that, particularly that app that Shane that ju just mentioned as well too, when I send out a survey, uh, the link to this webinar afterwards, I'll include the link to um, the Clin Trial Refer website as well too, so you can keep up to date with any information about the trials. Um, one last question that I will ask. So Sue just wants to understand if if disease relapses, so if the Hodgkin's comes back after the first line of treatment, is treatment different the second time around? Uh, yes, yes. I, I talked about a um. So you know, in our any patient who's fit enough, we we do do that salvage chemotherapy and then the stem cell transplant. But the, the salvage chemotherapy is you're right a different recipe. So. The often frontline treatments are things like that ABVD or escalated via COP. Um, for the second line treatment, uh, there are many different types that have been used. There have not been many head-to-head -head studies. Um, for example, the common one that I use is something called GDP. There's another one called ICE. There's another one called DHAP. Um, yeah, great, great question though, because once again, we are trying to bring some of those new agents to bring Tuximab, the um, uh, the the brittle or the you know, into that that second line treatment rather than waiting till people relapse after transplant. So um, and again, I think I uh, referred to that ALLG trial where they are, for example, they they're doing a randomised control trial on the relapse comparing GDP to that rentuximab and pembrolizumab before transplant. Um, but uh, but there is there's, there's quite a many recipes, but it is they're, they're probably the three main common ones. Um, technically we're not yet allowed to use those new agents as second line but um but if you don't get a very good response after that second line treatment then you know, most of us have a very low threshold to introducing them in yeah and i suppose um the one thing that i did just want to mention as well too shane's mentioned quite a few times that the different order of treatments that are available as well too and, and it's very much structured and restricted in australia by something called the pbs as well too shane did you want to just briefly mention how the PBS briefly mentioned how it works as well too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, I, I look, this is probably about my pay scale as well. But look, um, so you know, obviously, all in Australia, all drugs are uh, are covered by by, by Medicare. Um, so and 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 it's, and it's federal, it's federal based. So, for example, if a you know all these drugs that I've talked about have been the ABVD has been around for a long time. Um, you know, the drug company submits and, and they charge. The Australian government so much money, and, and then you know, Australia approves it, and, that, and they pay for it. Um, but then, when you've got these new drugs that come along, for example, Brentuximab, Vodotin. Um, so, if for that to get on the P, on the PBS for for 
for us for the government to pay for it so that means that the patient doesn't pay anything for it for the for the government to cover the costs um, what the drug company do is submit an application to what's called the PBAC um, and then that they need to have the regulatory bodies or Australia uh, people in, in, in the health department to to look at it and and give it approval or not and so they take different things to account um, they take into account does it work so um, and when I talk about does it work we've got does it reduce your risk of relapse which is obviously good but more importantly does it re re improve your survival because that's what really what the governments want to know um, so yep it's favorable if it reduces your risk of relapse but even better if it improves your survival and that's balanced against the other big factor which is the cost and and these drugs you know they do take a lot of money to, to develop um but the the when that's submitted they, they will make a sub suggestion on the cost um, and the government look at look at something called um, the quality. You know what's you know how how much how much per person will this cost, and 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 they weigh up the economic benefits of this. Um, and so some of the times these drugs get may rejected, and it may be because there is not enough data. Um, on the other hand, sometimes it's rejected because it is too expensive, and they'll ask the drug company, "Can you can you resubmit? But can you can you revisit your costs?" Um, and that's how the, the process goes. Um, and sometimes drug companies, you know, to, to get these drugs along, what they, they might make allowances. So, for example, mm -hmm. they might say, okay, well, we'll we'll change the indications rather than it, you, rather you know to, rather than being upfront, we'll only let you use it in relapse disease or, or something, um, so that it doesn't cost the, the health department so much. So, um, so that that probably is a, a summary. You know, the drug companies need to make a submission to the Australian government. Uh, for their drug because they're going to charge the Australian government a whole bunch of money and and they need to show that this is the outcomes um, and the government assesses whether it's worth it based on the on the outcomes and the costs. Yeah okay excellent thank you for explaining. Um, all right I don't think we've had any more questions come through this afternoon so I will wrap it up now and say thank you very much Shane for giving us your afternoon and pulling this presentation together for us we really appreciate it. Um, I, I, from Lymphoma Australia, want to say thank you very much to everyone as well too for coming along to the webinar this afternoon. I will send out the recording for those who did want to just revisit or go over any other points that Shane mentioned as well too. I'll also in that email include the link to the Clin Trial Refer um, app as well, and I'll also include some of um, the information about our previous webinars and how to sign up for more as well too. So thank you very much uh, for sharing your afternoon with us and for providing so much information about Hodgkin's lymphoma for us, Shane. We really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Yeah, what do I need to do? Uh...